Um, today I'm going to be discussing the usefulness of the concept backed blade in analyses of backed artefacts and in particular how useful it is for understanding blank selection um, processes in the house and support of Southern Africa. Is, this thing really is it on? I don't think it's turned on. I'll just yell. I'll just yell. Okay, so I'm looking at um, backed artifact blank selection processes in Southern Africa. So, um, Harrison's port backed artifacts are not very micro compared with those from other contexts like Australia. Uh, they come in a range of sizes and shapes, but usually they're roughly symmetrical, uh, reflected in a central axis, like that yellow dotted line, um, and, which is perpendicular to the chord. Um, and for this, this reason, they're often described as geometric. Um, a common narrative in Harrison's port literature is the description of backed artifacts as having been made on blades, or the use of the term backed blade as synonymous with backed artifact. So, however, not everyone means the same thing by backed blade. For some researchers, it implies that steep, small retouch scars have been applied to at least one edge of the artifact, although other researchers also advocate for naturally backed artifacts to be included. Um, because this wasn't a residue study, um, I chose to analyse artifacts with backing applied to an edge. For most researchers, the addition of the term blade implies that the original blanks were elongated with a minimum length to width ratio of two. This is pretty universal um, throughout blade definitions. However, a backed blade is often shorthand for backed prismatic blade, which is an elongated flake with one or two parallel straight longitudinal dorsal ridges and parallel lateral margins. Obviously then, the most frequently associated core reduction strategy with Harrison support backed artifacts is one which involves the production of prismatic blades. And there have been a number of similar sequences um, to prismatic blade manufacture proposed for different Howison's port assemblages. Um, while a connection between backed artifacts and blades is often made, it hasn't been demonstrated convinc convincingly with morphometric analysis. If, as the literature suggests, Harrison's port nappers were selecting for particular blank forms to make backed artefacts, then we should be able to see morphometric similarities in these blanks, especially given that backed artefacts are viewed as such a standardised class of artefacts. So I decided to test whether blank selection for backed artefacts in the Harrison's port was really as simple as selecting blades. To do this, it was necessary to ask these questions. So were backed artefacts really made on elongated flakes? What range of dorsal scar arrangements do backed artefacts display? What characteristics do backed artefacts have in common? So this can tell us what traits Harrison's port nappers saw as important to control or select for. Um, which characteristics of backed artefact blanks varied between specimens? And this can tell us what attributes nappers did not view as so important to control for. And finally, I thought that I should have a bit of a look at whether the variability in blank artifact, in backed artifact blank morphologies could be explained by variation in flake blank production systems. So the assemblages that I've been looking at were Howison's Port Shelter and Nelson Bay Cave, which you can see in red. Um, and I also got the chance to look at backed artifacts from one layer at Classies before the Isico Museum closed for renovations. So all of these sites that I'm talking about today are clustered in that sort of Eastern Cape region. Um, for the analysis I'm presenting, I've pulled the backed artefacts from all three sites together. So I won't be discussing intersite or chronological variability. Um, but tomorrow at the conference, um, I'll be describing some site specific chronological findings for Nelson Bay Cave. I also made the decision to only look at complete backed artefacts to avoid biasing the sample with double ups or with incomplete dorsal surface information. I also excluded any backed artefacts which were not geometric in plan shape uh, because we can't be sure that more irregularly backed artefacts represent the same phenomenon, at least as it's described in the literature. And to answer my research questions, I chose to use relative shape characteristics, mostly ratios of pairs of attributes to remove the effects of size from the results. Um, I'm also focusing on the characteristics of the backed artefacts which retain original blank information and haven't been changed by napping. 
So on the right panel you can see a list of those. So dorsal scar arrangement, the usual elongation. Um, I made two ratios, one of width at 25% and width at 75% and one of thickness at 25% and thickness at 75%. Um, and then I also have a ratio of most extreme chord depth to chord length, which I'll explain a little bit later, and mean chord edge angle because that's universal across specimens. So to start with blank elongation, um, only 60% of the complete backed artifacts I analysed had elongation index values of two or greater. This isn't entirely unexpected, given that backing removes parts of the flake. You can see from this table that crescents and truncations tended to be less elongated than the other forms. Given that backing removes length in all of these cases, I decided to have a play around with how the proportions of elongated backed artifacts changes um, when the, the length of the backed artifacts is increased to make up for the material that's been removed. So now clearly in two scenarios, so for crescents and for some trapezia, um, width is also reduced by backing. But for the purpose of, of this table, um, it's just to show that even without adding extra width to these specimens, which would reduce their elongation, adding up to 30% of extra length still doesn't push all artefacts above the elongation threshold. In this scenario, about 20% of the original backed artefact lengths remain below the elongation threshold for blades. And I think something to think about here is that if the finished backed artefact specimen doesn't have to be elongated, and 40% of them weren't, then there's really no obvious motivation to choose a blank with this characteristic to begin with. So as far as dorsal scar arrangement goes, four backed artefacts had cortex on their dorsal surfaces and two in fact had up to 45% of their dorsal surfaces covered in cortex. The number of dorsal ridges in the sample ranged from 0 to 8. Um, the most common was 2, um, but the average was closer to 3. Nearly one third of specimens did not have parallel longitudinal dorsal ridges and were therefore not made using prismatic core reduction. Um, the category of longitudinal ridges here includes unidirectional scars and scars from opposing platforms and the description of other dorsal surfaces in this instance mostly includes those that have um, bidirectional perpendicular scars. So the characteristic which showed by far the most variation was cord edge shape. Nearly a third of backed artefacts in the sample had a sudden deviation in their cord edges as a result of intersection by a dorsal ridge. So that's what I've called a dog leg. Um, this tells us that the dorsal ridges and lateral margins were not parallel on these specimens. Most cord edges were in fact convex and only 20% were straight. So as you can see from the coefficient of variation for cord curvature, um, so cord curvature is a ratio of cord length to maximum convexity or concavity, so, oops, my bad. Okay. Um, So it's, it's, it's extremely variable and even when I removed the effect of whether the curve was negative or positive, so concave or convex, um, the variation was still extremely high. So while nappers allowed cord curvature to vary wildly, a number of blank characteristics were more tightly controlled. For example, cord edge angle was consistently quite acute, about 36 degrees, um, and showed relatively little variability which is interesting given the results for cord curvature. Another characteristic which showed less variability was the thickness consistency ratio, which showed that nappers were reliably choosing flakes whose thickness was roughly consistent or constant from proximal to distal ends. The width consistency ratio tells us some interesting things about blanks chosen for transformation into trapezia and truncations. In many cases, flakes with consistent widths, where the ratio equals one or is, about, is close to one, um, were chosen to be turned into trapezia or truncations. And in the cases where these kinds of backed artefacts had backing on a lateral edge opposite the cord, um, this backing was used to make the width ratio as close to one as possible. So you can see how similar they are for the two groups. Um, while this re result is logical, at least for trapezia, from a symmetry perspective, 
I think it's still pretty cool to see direct evidence of Napa's seeking symmetry in this way. So to investigate the relationship between blank production strategy and morphological variability, I've used dorsal scar pattern as a proxy for blank production method. Um, analyses of variants show that there were no significant differences in the mean values of the thickness consistency ratio for blanks of different dorsal scar patterns, and the result was the same for the width consistency ratio and the chord edge angle. So these characteristics were constant, constant across production method. Um, the mean chord curvatures, however, were significantly different for different dorsal scar patterns. So backed artifacts with radial dorsal scars had the most curved or at least or the least straight chord edges, uh, while parallel removals produced blanks with straighter margins and therefore backed artifacts with straighter chords. So if we return to my original research questions, um, were nappers really just looking for blades when selecting blanks for backed artifacts? Well, if we consider that 40% of backed artifacts were not elongated, and at least one third of the specimens did not have dorsal surfaces consistent with prismatic blade manufacture, it seems pretty unlikely that prismatic blades were the targets for blank selection. And when we consider that there is evidence that particular characteristics were selected for, like acute chord edge angle and consistent thickness, while others were left to vary, like chord curvature, it seems even more unlikely that blades were the target, target, targeted blank form. The characteristics selected for are not included in definitions of blades, and the extreme variability in chord curvature displayed by the backed artefacts is contrary to what we would expect for an assemblage of prismatic blades. Overall, therefore, the evidence paints a more complex picture of backed artefact blank selection than just the selection of blades. The evidence actually suggests that characteristics not associated with traditional blade definitions were selected for. So for Howison's port nappers, blank selection seems to have been less about the blanks being prismatic blades and more about whether or not they had particular characteristics. So evidence of this phenomenon that I've discussed here um, exists in the wider literature about the Howison's port. Um, for example, here's a collection of some images that I've taken from some articles. Um, which are pretty good examples um, of the kind of variability in dorsal scars and dorsal ridge arrangements on backed artefacts from Subudu, Clipdrift and Dickwoof. So in conclusion then, it's clear from this evidence that applying the concept backed blade to describe how a support backed artefacts is problematic and misleading in a substantial number of cases. It conceals a lot of the complexity in blank selection processes and redirects the focus from what was actually required to make a backed artefact. I hope that this analysis has shown that it is more productive to look at the kinds of morphological characteristics being selected for than to just assume that backed artefacts um, were made on blades. And I'd just like to thank these people um, and also the organisers for giving me the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Yeah, look, I'd, I'd just like to, um, it's perhaps not a question, but, but, but uh, a comment. I mean, it seems, seems to me that one of, the, one of the things that Amy is really nicely illustrating is that the, the categories we're interested in don't come as a package. It's not like, they, it's not like the different things that, that are involved, like size or shape or blank form, map onto each other in, in a close way. And so... I know there was some discussion this morning, but I mean, hearing this kind of case study makes me think that you would be better off having categories that were labelled things like backed symmetrical blade, or backed asymmetrical blade, or backed asymmetrical Lavalois flake, and so on, rather than, rather than trying to have a single grouping, having categories that are labelled due to decompose those packages and acknowledge the fact that they, they aren't all bundled in a particular way. Mm. Uh, Thank you, Amy. Very interesting. Uh, did raw material play any role in your analysis? Um, I did look for it as one of the, the factors that might be 
um, causing some of the variation, but it really didn't didn't make Which a difference. Which raw materials did you include? So this assemblage has quartzite, um, silcrete, quartz, and um, indurated shale horn valves. I see. I think it's really important to include in your analysis a picture of the whole assemblage, or for that layer, mm -hmm. because through the house and spur, there's differences in the napping techniques and yeah. technology followed. Mm -hmm. So it's you're really um, generalizing quite grossly in, in this sense, whereas I think you should go on a fine level, look at the whole assemblage, and then do your analysis. For instance, see how many flakes actually occur in that assemblage, how many layers, what is the, um, what is the technique and technology followed? Yeah, so today I was just presenting a kind of general backed artifact study, but tomorrow I'm going to be looking more specifically at change over time in Nelson Bay and those kinds of issues. So. Thank you. Uh, Marius, and I think Lars had your hand up first, and then you'll come to go either one of you. Yeah, Marius, I just want to link to, to Sarah, it's also very, I think we should caution, caution against making blanket statements about the house and sport by having looked and represented. We know that there's a lot of variation, even though we call it the house and sport. Um, so, so I want to link up with what Sara says. One study can only be contextualized in what it says about this thing. And then if these patterns repeat over time and space, we can start spreading the way that we think about these things. And also your cause that is associated with what these things are produced on. You need to look at the whole assemblage. And then in different house and sport assemblages, we get different types of emphasis on whether people wanted to make segments or the crescents, or whether they shape things more into the trapezes or that kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting stuff. I think just to Amy's defense, I think she did mention a few times that today she's narrowed it down and I think tomorrow we might see a bit more of the variability uh, yeah, which we definitely. will look forward to, of course. Uh, Lars, uh, you had a question? Oh, it's just a, a, yeah, a comment r r regarding uh, um, in, in your study, there uh, you kind of throw away the concept of, of blade, but... Uh, uh, in Not throw away, but just look, I, um, I think we should look a bit more closely. That's and I think to be able to do that, uh, uh, if we want to... Or, recontextualize uh, uh, that idea of blade, um, there really does need to be a, an investigation into the entire sequence of production and not just these final issues because I think uh, 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 if we're looking only at uh, dorsal scar pattern, um, there's going to be a, 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 a significant uh, number of those uh, uh, categories with perhaps per perpendicular uh, scar patterns that are actually can be completely integrated within a, a, a prismatic uh, a, a core debitage. These are your crests, these yes. are your standard uh, waste products. So I think there may be a bunch of categories in there that you're perhaps tossing out of the blade family that can be um, in there. I think you need I, to evaluate the, the variation of these dorsal I totally products. agree with you, but what I was testing here was really um, the, the tradition, what the blank actually looked like. Mm -hmm. So does the backed artifact have two ridges or one ridge running straight down its length, that kind of thing. So it is a bit of a stretch to make assumptions about the production systems, but really it, it, it is the case that um, a range of, of ridge constructions and, and flake scar directions were on these backed artifacts. It wasn't just two ridges. Um, and so I think that's what's really important about it, rather than maybe where it came from. So? On that point, just... In the clip drift assemblage, for example, many of the blades have um, one ridge and then flake scars come from, from the lateral side. So it wouldn't have two ridges. So, you know, you must look at your um, assumption before you tie certain patterns to a blade strategy because there are different blade strategies. Yes. Um. Just to add to Peter's, or to respond to Peter's comments about the need for, or about suggested concepts we could use uh, here being backed blade, backed, uh, and various others. Um, I think again, your point made much earlier about the necessi necessity of research questions. Um, 
Backing is a research question that applies to very specific periods in Southern African prehistory. Um, uh, in fact, we have you know, three chunks of time that describe three different kinds of microliths in Southern Africa. We have this stuff, uh, then in MIS 3 slash 2 we have small flake production, and then in MIS 2 proper we have uh, bladelets, and then in the Holocene we have back tools. So I think a detailed typology to deal with back backing does nothing for us in, MI in about a 40,000 year period of MIS 3 to 2. And perhaps this is where something focused more on small and retouched tool production slash bladelets becomes the more useful framework. On either ends, a different methodology completely is employed, one with a more detailed approach to backing and how it is operationalized. Um, so again, we can't blank it even just for a region. Um, what kind of method might best apply? Uh, it seems to have to be more specific than even that. Um, any other questions?